Promotional stills from season one of the beloved lower ethereal hierarchy children's serial Legends of the Golden Child. By episode 16 of season one, Legends of the Golden Child had already established itself as a cult classic in the city of the ever open eye and the surrounding dreamlands. Syndication talks were well underway with the Agash Continuum, at that time the current authority, in the upper ethereal hierarchy, and bootleg copies on Holodisc and Dreamchip were popping up in such far-flung places as Zeb, City of the Necromancers, and even in various occult markets on the hundred-year coast. With a popularity only rivaled by the millennia-spanning smash hit soap opera Hasteron's Dilemma, Legends went on to establish itself firmly in the collective consciousness of citizens all across the ethereal hierarchy. Various cults and religious sects that took direct inspiration from the show sprang up over the course of its 17-season run, with critics citing the show's gritty realism as a potential cause of this form of extreme fandom. In part, this behavior is why a reboot of the show has never happened. Season 17 ends halfway through, on a cliffhanger, due to the entire cast and crew being wiped out by a particularly virulent strain of dream rot. The show first aired during the eternal rule of the silent monks in the city of the ever open eye. But the relatively stricter blasphemy laws under the Empire of the Bleeding Eye have made any continuation of the series a potential nightmare. Episode 17, helmed by NetherRealm director Sphinx Bugol, is notable for taking place entirely in the kingdom of Edelon, the mysterious abode of spirits, shades, demons, and other nether entities. Used as a bargaining chip in a union dispute with the Extradimensional Actors Guild, this episode is famous for its incomprehensible plot and, even by the standards of Legends of the Golden Child, bizarre imagery. Voiced entirely in multiple dialects of corpse tongue and high demonic, and without subtitles, fans in the city of the ever open eye and the surrounding dreamlands were left baffled by this episode. Dripping Nerve magazine called the distasteful result of pandering to otherworldly interests. To make matters worse, due to a rash of spiritual possessions and ectoplasmic tumors in scores of viewers after it first aired, it was ascertained that a cabal of demonic terrorists working in production on the show had encoded an alchemical curse into the holodata. Due to, to this, episode 17 is usually left out of rerun programming, although it can be found in any good occult market in the lower or upper ethereal hierarchies. Episode 18 is notable for its explicit and potentially catastrophic political message regarding the situation in the upper ethereal hierarchy at the time. The upper and lower hierarchies tend to stay out of each other's business when it comes to the running of their respective societies, and neither has jurisdiction over the other in any legal or religious matters, but the producers at Golden Child Studios must be considered brave or even foolhardy considering they had just signed a licensing deal with the Janus Company of Hasteron's Dilemma fame. The episode centers around amateur scientist Oren Grape discovering a plot to infiltrate the lower hierarchy, and amusingly the out-of-the-way town of Wizard's Bend is the epicenter of the invasion by emissarial tendrils of the Agash Continuum. Although utterly uncontroversial in the upper hierarchy, the artificial hive-mind overlord of the Agash Continuum was in reality a great source of anxiety for many citizens of the lower hierarchy. In the fictional world of Legends of the Golden Child, these fears of what some called the machine abomination were given voice. Set against the distracting, and what Skinless Face magazine called culturally insensitive, background of the Festival of the Broken Moon, Grape struggles to bring the situation to the attention of Mayor Brilbosh and the town elders. Because of all the associated troubles of having so many strangers from across the lower hierarchy in town, the authorities have better things to do than listen to the paranoid ramblings of a local crank. Because of this, the machine abomination succeeds in infecting and taking over many citizens and even whole patches of reality itself. The episode ends with a small child mumbling a string of numbers to herself whilst inscribing the sigil of gas tongue, a very heavy-handed metaphor indeed. By the latter half of season one, Legends of the Golden Child was a smash hit success and a firm favorite amongst children all across the lower ethereal hierarchy. At this stage, licensing negotiations were well underway with the Janus Corporation in the upper hierarchy, the production company behind the ever-popular Hasteron's Dilemma. As part of these discussions, the production and distribution of merchandise was agreed upon and Janus Toys began work on a line of Legends of the Golden Child action figures. 
The release of these toys in both the upper and lower hierarchies coincided with the first episode of Season 2 going to air, as well as Season 1 in its entirety becoming available in the upper hierarchy for the first time. Janus Toys enjoyed record profits, with a portion of that wealth trickling down to the humble Golden Child Studios, who poured the funds right back into the show, which noticeably improved in both scope and production values. That first line of toys has since been pulled from production, with as many of them as possible being incinerated in the cleansing lava of the volcano of Shagath on the holy planetoid of Ranxus 7. Celebrity seer Yubelo's Praxis discovered through astral divination that each toy contained a sliver of soul flesh from deceased, ex-cast, and crew members from Hasteron's Dilemma, presumably punishment for perceived opposition towards the mysterious and terrible unnamed producers.